Amen, amen. Oh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Those who are on live with us here at Mantle Matters, this is our uh, ministry to the marketplace at Perspective Matters Ministries. Uh, here tonight we are continuing on with our series, our series entitled Exploring Entrepreneurship from a kingdom perspective. Yes, God has a perspective even when it comes down to business, the business, if you will, of business. But the business that the Lord is calling us to is his business. Ah, it, it is his business. He is the creator of occupation. He is the creator of, uh, of the idea of work. That work is so his idea of work is so divergent from the world's idea of a job. Uh, some of us have jobs. God is calling us to work. Not to jobs, but to work. Now, your job may be a part of God providing for the work that he's actually given you to do. Some of our work needs to be financed, and God puts you on a job to finance the work that he's called you to do. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, that's what Paul did. Paul was a tent maker. Didn't talk a whole lot about him making tents and con having conquests in the business world, but it was through tent making that financed his pastoral work, that's right. which was the work that he went down in history for. He wasn't a, a historical tent maker. Like, in the same way, Jesus was not a historical carpenter. I don't know if there's any preserved work from his hands. I sure would like to own one. Wouldn't you love to own a bench or something that was uh, hammered out and, and custom built by the hands of our Messiah? Can you imagine? Mm. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine the, the pricelessness of that kind of an artifact? Uh, just think of what a... a uh, uh, an original Leonardo da Vinci uh, painting is worth. Think of the Mona Lisa, how priceless that woman with that kind of cockeyed half smile, how priceless that painting is, is, is because of who painted it. Amen. Can you imagine having a piece of furniture or furnishings that was made by the hands that made you? Oh, that's a Holy Spirit thought. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for just downloading yeah. that into my spirit. Can you imagine how priceless a work yeah. of his hands would be? But guess what? We have that. You're it. You are that priceless object that he made with his hands. Nobody can put a price on you. You're priceless. And be mindful of anyone who would dare try to put a price tag on you or undervalue you. You've got more value than you could possibly imagine. So, in that same way, uh, many of us are being put to, to jobs so that we can be put to work. But don't get the two twisted. Don't get the two twisted. So we're going to talk about tonight in our series, Exploring Entrepreneurship from a Kingdom Perspective, the last three weeks Along the lines of this study, we've been looking at the power of your inheritance. Seeing that what we get from our father, Abraham, is passed on to his offspring, his children, of which you and I are a blessed part. We've been adopted into his family, but we're not like stepchildren. We are wholly born into the family of God when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And we get the same, kind, the same promise that was promised to our father of faith, Abraham, is the same promise that is passed down to his offspring by faith, according to faith, of which you are. So tonight we're going to look at The Power of Your Inheritance, Part 4, subtitled, How You'll Come Into Your Inheritance. Oh, yes. How You'll Come Into Your Inheritance. So let's go before the Lord. We need to summon summons the power of the Holy Spirit tonight. I know I need it. My voice is failing, and uh, I need a Holy Spirit charge so that we can get through this, and not just merely get through this, but power through it with the power of dunamis, the Greek word for uh, a divine 
power that comes only from God, not from your inner self, but from God's self working inside of you. I need that tonight. And I'm sure that in many ways you need it as well, given some of the things that are going on in the world today. And we're going to certainly cross-reference those things that are pertinent to our study tonight. Let's go before the Lord and pray. <coughs> Father God, we come before you, Lord God, on this Tuesday night, giving you praise, honor, and glory for another opportunity to hear from heaven, to be open and pride open, Lord God, with the word of prophecy tonight, that we may be prepared for training for reigning. Oh God, you are training us tonight. Lord God, we pray, Father God, that you would take us to a new level in our understanding of who we are in Christ Jesus. Lord God, have your way. Lord God, manufacture out of us the people that are anticipating your coming and that will reign and rule with you as your co-regents. We feel that hour is upon us. That hour is sooner than later. And we praise you, O oh God, that we are living in such a time that we have the anticipation that we do of your soon arrival, our soon be caught up to meet you face to face, and then being uh, prepared as we worship you, waiting for the tribulation to pass, that we might come down to this earth when you come down and reign and rule with you as your, as your landlords upon your earth. Prepare us now to be the kinds of stewards that you would seed the nation's wealth to. Lord, have your way, Holy Spirit. Come now. It, possess my, my throat, O oh God. Father God, uh, heal my vocal cords, Lord God. Bring fullness of voice and power to me that your word may be said and spoken crystal clear. Not my words, but your words prevail, O oh God. Speak through me, O oh God. Think with my mind, speak with my mouth. Those truths that you would have us to know and to apply to our lives, that we may be fit managers, pressed into the service of your kingdom, now and forevermore. These things we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So whether you're joining us live tonight or whether you're joining us uh, after the fact, watching on YouTube video, I want to welcome you again to this next segment of uh, our powerful series, Exploring entrepreneurship from a kingdom perspective, the power of your inheritance, part four. Here we're going to talk about uh, how you'll come into your inheritance. If you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60. Here in the 60th chapter of Isaiah, what was promised to Abraham Isaiah, through the prophecy of the Lord through Isaiah, uh, the Lord is showing us and telling us when we're about to come into the promises that were promised to our father of the faith, Abraham, in, back in Genesis chapters 12 through uh, 15, and then again in chapter 17, where the Abrahamic covenant is renewed on a continual basis by the Lord. How he confronts Abraham, uh, as Abraham confronts the Lord, oftentimes with his lack, saying, Lord, but you promised me a child. He said I'd be the father of many nations. But now in, in chapter 17, Abram says, well, look, now I'm, I'm 99 years old, and, and the Lord is promising him a child, but not only promising him a child, but promising that it would come out of his loins and be birthed through Sarah. And Abraham laughed. I mean, literally fell down on his face laughing at the promise of God. Can you imagine how incongruous that is? That here, Abraham, in the presence of God himself, when God tells him, oh, you're going to be a daddy, you, you might be 99, and Sarah might be as old as she is, but you're going to be a daddy. Uh, picture um, the Maury Povich show in reverse, an, an early days version of Maury Povich. Yes, you will be the father. <laughs> and, and Abraham, knowing uh, his, um, what he lacked in his vitality and physicality, and what his wife Sarah lacked in her vitality and physicality, Abraham had a real good laugh. 
He had a belly laugh. He had one of those, you just fall down on your face and laugh. All right? One of those, after watching a Richard Pryor sketch now, and not all of us have been holy all of our lives. Now, come on. <laughs> one of those where you rolling over in the theater kind of laughter. That's what Abraham did. And God got him. God got him a gotcha. He said, okay, you, when, when this child is born, not if, but when, you're going to name him Isaac. Guess what it means? Laughter. Laughter. Oh, yeah, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to give you what you don't think you can do for yourself because you can't. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But I'm going to see to it that it's done. So those promises that were passed on to Abraham passed to us as well. And here it is worked out in glory uh, as prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 60 beginning at verse 1. And, and this is God speaking to us. What we come to learn through our study the last three weeks is that we are the offspring of Abraham. We are, in fact, if you will, uh, the Israel that Jesus is speaking of, that, that God is speaking of. And here, it says, here he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now, now, in this first verse, look at the descriptiveness of God speaking to his people, of which you and I are a part if we're in Christ Jesus. Arise. In other words, get up. If you're sitting down, if you're laying down, if you're in a prostrate position because you're tired, because you've run out of gas, if you've grown weary and well-doing, arise. Get up. Shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The Lord is being very specific. He's calling you and me out of the world, and he's telling us it's time to rise and shine. As the world grows darker, you are going to shine like never before. You're going to wear my glory. You're going to be differentiated from this world in ways that you never were before because the world is growing darker, which means that your light, my light through you, is going to shine all the brighter. That's what's happening in the world today. And what we're witnessing today is through politics, through other means, through scandal, through other means, we're seeing uh, the light dim on some folk who are holding up the light, calling themselves Christians, but who are not. God is in the process right now of separating the goats from the sheep, removing the goats from the sheep and saying, hey, here's, here's my real children and here's my pretenders. I'm calling out the pretenders. That's what God is doing. He's separating people out. Uh, we can line up with his word. And if you're not lined up with his word, you're going to be lined up with the goats. He's separating the wheat from the tares, just as he promised he would do before the very close of the age. Yes, we would come up together. The pretenders and the authentic together. But before it's done, he's going to have a great shaking out. And we've been witnessing that. Lo and behold, particularly, in particular, these last couple of years. And this is what he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. He's calling you out. He's calling out the church, the remnant church of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 2. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. So this thing is not only going to be a physical darkness, but also a spiritual one, a, a darkness that will cover the peoples. Jesus said that in the latter days, that because of, the, of lawlessness being increased, the hearts of many, the love of many would grow cold. Ah. We're witnessing that, are we not? We're seeing that in the world today. And he says, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. Mm. 
but the Lord will arise upon you. Notice how he differentiates you from other peoples. Ah, he's calling us out as his own, but he's calling out you, and he's also calling out, in contrast, the peoples. Uh, there's the crowd, and then there, there's you and I. There, there, there's his beloved. All right? So he's saying that there will be a distinction made. Ah, there will be a distinction made. And verse, verse 3, and the nations shall come to your light. Ah, listen, listen, listen. And the nations shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. My God. The distinguishing factor on us will be so different that it will attract the attention of people in the world with eyes to see, that will have at least some kind of discernment to see. There's something different about those people over yonder. Uh, there, there's some light that I perceive that I need because I perceive that I'm dwelling in darkness that I don't want to be a part of. And, and kings, rulers, uh, will, will be drawn to the light that God has cast upon you and upon me. Verse number four, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes all around, lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Verse five, then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. This is not a prosperity gospel. This is the gospel manifest. This is the word of God, that the wealth of nations would be turned over to the people of God. This is that great wealth transfer that God has been engineering from the beginning, that those in the world would work by the sweat of their brow, by toil, and even by scheming and being scandalous to create wealth, that they will wind up leaving at your foot. Okay? Uh, that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. The, the manifestation of this is right here in this particular verse, in this particular chapter, chapter 60 of Isaiah. All right? Uh, notice that it says in verse 5, then you shall see and be radiant. In other words, you'll see the, my glory on you yourself. Yeah, you'll be able to distinguish yourself that, hey, there's something different going on with, with, with me and, and my, my fellow believers. Uh, that, that the Lord will turn the tables like he turned the money changers' tables over. He's about to turn over the tables of the wealth of the world and is about to dump on you, not for your sake, not for your kingdom, not for your building of an empire, but for the Lord's. And he's only going to pour into and allow to be poured into those whom he can trust. If God cannot trust you with material wealth, how can he trust you with greater wealth that's coming? That's why this is just a test. When, when the Lord puts a dollar or a dime in your hand, what you do with it and how well you manage it is a test of your management capabilities. When we come into the kingdom, how much can God really trust you with? Well, how much could he trust you with now? If he can't trust you with $100 now, don't think you're going to have a million dollars when you come into his kingdom. Okay? So all of this is just a test case. Now, let's... Let's go down to verse 11. We're talking here about how you'll come into your inheritance. Notice what he says in, in verse 5 again. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exalt. This is where we should be at uh, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually right now. As the world is buried in its perplexity at earthquakes, at storms, that right now in this moment, uh, there are hordes of people trying to dig folk out that are buried 
in Mexico City under rubble right now. Lives are being lost even as I speak right now. Throughout the Caribbean, same thing is going on right now. Lives are being destroyed because of a monster hurricane in the form of Hurricane Maria that is bearing down on Puerto Rico right in this hour that has decimated the island of Dominica to the point where they can't even get pictures. It's, that, it's been that decimated. There's absolutely no power, no communication. So we're seeing the Lord doing some shaking and perplexing the earth, but this is our hour to shine. This is our hour where the world is cowering in fear. We should be exulting with joy at our expectation that our blessed hope is about to come. And that alone would cause people to say, what's wrong with you people? How are you so merry right now when the rest of the world is mourning? Because our promised day is arriving. We see it coming. Our blessed hope is on the way. So you can cry if you want to, but I'm going to get my dance on. I'm going to get my praise on. I'm going to get my rejoice on. And the world that's tired of mourning is going to see our rejoicing and say, Ooh, I want to come where the party's at. Show me where the party's at. The party's over here. The party's over here with us. Ah, the, the flip. The script has flipped, and the party isn't in the world anymore. The party's in the church. Come on aboard. Let us show you what we have to be so joyful and exultant about. The good news of the gospel has never been more good than when the world is embroiled in turmoil and trouble. We got good news for you. Come on over here to the other side. We've got good news for you. Let's look at verse 11. Now, now, verse, and I, I want you to look at, at verse 6 through 10 in your spare time. Because here you're going to see how the wealth is transferred, what takes place. Uh, that there is indeed a physical transference of wealth from out of the nations into the kingdom of God. Represented by his ambassadors. That would be you and I. He didn't say that the wealth would be laid at his feet. It would be laid at your feet, which is as good as his feet right here on this earth, because that's what we are, his ambassadors and his emissaries. But he's got to be able to trust you with what he's already given you. Verse 11, here's God's word to us who have ears to hear. Your gates shall be open continually. In other words, you remember, um, uh, I remember this chain of convenience stores that opened up in, I do believe it was the 1970s. I was a, a, a young preteen. I remember moving into Hillside, New Jersey uh, from Newark in 1970. And there was this little establishment, a little convenience store, I'd never seen one before, called 7-Eleven, 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven was open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And then we find that many 7-Elevens, after a while, began to open their gates continually. They never closed. You can find 7-Eleven open 24-7. They need to re <laughs> rename it. God is saying that your gates, your doors will be open continually. Now, what does this mean to you and I practically? It means that you will always be open for business. And, and we're able to do that for the first time ever in world history. Your transacting business is not limited to business hours. Because guess what? Business can be contracted today online 24-7, 365, with storefronts that never close. So this speaks of even uh, business and commerce being done via online. And we're seeing the world move to that model to the point that today, 97 days before Christmas, Toys R Us filed for bankruptcy. Today. Today. Toys R Us has been literally been, uh, I'm not going to say they're out of business, but they've been turned upside down because of companies like, online companies like Amazon.com. 
because of online commerce, brick and mortar, mortar stores have reached their mortality. Brick and mortar stores, are you hearing me? Brick and mortar star, stores have reached their mortality. Uh, we've seen Barnes and Noble stores close one after the other because Amazon is selling more books than anybody. Okay? So we are seeing this come to light and come to pass, that this scripture really prophesied the kind of genesis that we've seen and metamorphosis of commerce, that stores are no longer limited to locations or business hours. Banks are not now subject to bankers' hours. Remember, you can only go to the bank from 9 to 3, and you, you would just a fish out of water if you weren't able to make it to the bank by 3 o'clock. Then we got ATM machines. Bank is open all the time. Now we got it even better. You don't even need to go to an ATM machine. I can't tell you the last, I, last time I was at an ATM machine was almost a month ago to pull out 100 bucks. But now I do all my banking online. I make my deposits even online. All right? I get automatic deposits. I, I don't have a reason to go to I can do my banking 24-7. I don't care where I am anywhere in the world. I can find out what my bank balance is to the penny anytime, right through my smartphone. This is what the Word of God was predicting before we got to this information age. Your gates shall be open continually. God is speaking to the entrepreneur in you. Okay? Time to start getting used to what the Word is pointing us to in the world. Even online commerce, your gates shall be open continually. Listen, day and night, they shall not be shut. Why? I'm glad you asked. That people may bring to you the wealth of the nations. Hello, the word can't be more clear. God isn't speaking in any veiled language here. This is real down-to-earth stuff. This didn't make sense 20 years ago. Nobody could have seen nor predicted the kind of global economy that now has taken over the entire world. I don't care where you go anywhere in the world. If you can get an Internet connection, you can do business, and people are, even to the uttermost corners of the earth. God has predicted and prophesied this time. That the entire world would see his coming, as the entire world is right now, watching calamity after calamity and leaving the world scratching its head, that it would live up to the prophecy of Luke chapter 21, verse 25, where it said that the world would be in perplexity at the things that it's witnessing. We are in that day. Thus so as well, we are in that day of commerce that is done 24-7-365. Now, listen. I want to go through verse 11 again, and I'm going to read through 22. Your gates shall be open continually, day and night they shall not be shut, that people may bring to you, you, you. You know what? Get personal with it. Cross out the you and write your name in it. That the world would bring to you, to Philip, to Lola, uh, to Esther, to Deborah, to Gloria, the wealth of the nations, to Dewana, to Stephan, the wealth of the nations, with their kings led in procession. So this won't just be um, uh, amateur night at the Apollo. Uh, these won't be just paupers bringing uh, uh, their nickels and, and their, their pennies to you. No, they'll be led by kings. Rulers of this world will be transferring their wealth into the kingdom of God through you. Can you be trusted? Can you be trusted? Verse 12. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. This is part of the Abrahamic covenant. What did the Lord say to Abraham right out of the box in Genesis chapter 12? 
he said that when he blessed Abraham, he said, I will bless the nations that bless you, and I will what? I will curse the nations that curse you. And here is God saying the same thing through Isaiah to people thousands of years later. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall utterly, shall be utterly laid waste. God is not mincing his words. He said that uh, in him you will find a refuge. He would be what? what we, we learned last week in our study in Mantle, Mantle Matters, that he would be your shield, that he would surely bring about his promises, and that your reward would be very great. That was the promise to Abraham and his offspring. Good evening and hello to his offspring. I'm talking to you right now. And God is saying, even thousands of years after I promised Abraham, I'm promising you today, you his offspring, that the nations that don't serve you, because they're serving me, they've got to serve you because you're my emissary, you're my landlord, they've got to pay you to pay me the owner of the property which is the earth and the fullness thereof. If they don't serve me by serving you, I'm going to utterly lay them waste. That is the word of God. Your enemies don't stand a chance. Don't operate in fear. Don't worry about your enemies. I'm not scared about, of, my, of my enemies. All right? uh, we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with our enemy and know that we've got the promise of God that we win. And it's winning time, y'all. It's time for us to exalt and get excited because our day is is finally come. Our day is nigh where we win. Verse 13, the glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. And where did the Lord say he would tabernacle? In you, in me. That the glory of Lebanon shall come. He's talking about uh, Lebanon was known for its fine wood. Its strong woods that were used to construct even the temple that Solomon built. That uh, the pines and the cypress uh, came in and was shipped into the promised land. Shipped to Jerusalem by way of Lebanon. And the Lord says, in the same way I built my house in Jerusalem, I purpose to build you, my people, in whom and with whom I will dwell. You are the final uh, place of God's tabernacle. You are his temple. You are, we are the temple that he is building, block by block, soul by soul. And he says this, even in the midst of all of the hubbub surrounding the world, I will make the place of my feet glorious. Where we see the inglorious in the world, God says, I'm going to contrast that by what I do in building my people. Where the world will know that I dwell with them. I'm with them. Who are you with? I'm with them. Verse 14 the sons, listen, listen, listen now. If for, I'm speaking to all of those who've been beat down, all of those who've been oppressed, afflicted, wondering when in the world am I going to win? When is it that the, the first shall be last and the last will finally be first? When is it that I won't be the tail anymore, but I will come into my headship, that I will be the head, that I won't feel like I'm constantly going down, but that I'm on the come up, that I can only rise as God promised. Here it is, verse 14. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Ah, all of those who exalted themselves over you and over your God will come groveling at your feet, bearing gifts, 
because they will recognize you as be, being authentically God's. God's own people, his emissaries on this earth, and they will be convicted knowing that they've been wrong all along. Oh, that's something to shout about. There's reason to get your dance on. Uh, verse 15, whereas, remember your past, God is saying, remember your past? Uh, here, I just want you to get a glimpse, but I don't want you to look too long. Every rear view mirror is infinitely smaller than the front windshield because God wants your focus to be what's in front of you rather than behind you. But the Lord says, I do want you to quantify where you're at and where you're going by where you've been. Just glance back. Just take a quick whoop, whoop, and let me show you how far I've brought you. This is what he says in verse 15. Whereas you've been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. Verse 16, you shall suck the milk of nations. In other words, the nourishment that the nations nourish themselves and their rich and their rulers, ah, that's going to be for you now. I'm turning the tables. I'm going to nourish you with what they've been nourishing and getting fat on themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've just been getting fat for the slaughter. But for you, it's going to be for my glory. And I'm going to turn what was on them over to you. Oh, isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? You shall suck the milk of nations. You shall nurse at the breast of kings. In other words, the kings will nourish you with their substance, with the wealth that they have gotten and gained ingloriously. I'm going to turn it into a glorious blessing for you. Yeah, they're going to wind up feeding you where they were taxing you at one time. Ah, uh, the tax is going to be turned right over to you. God is going to flip the script quicker than you can say, here he comes. And you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. God says, when I do these things, you're going to know it wasn't you. You're going to know it was me all the while because you know your limitations. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But I'm going to flip the script so hard and heavy that you're going to have no doubt that this was my work. And so will the world know that I am your Savior and your Redeemer. Verse 17. <clears throat> God puts a contrast from where you've been to where he's taking you and what he's doing for you right in the moment. He says this, instead of bronze, I will bring gold. And instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron, I will make your overseers peace, and your taskmasters righteousness. Remember those who ruled over you with a strong hand, those who oppressed and afflicted you? I'm going to flip the script, and instead of their unrighteousness and their, uh, uh, and their op oppressiveness born of hatred, I'm going to flip the script, and your only overseers, your only supervisors will be my peace upon you. <clears throat> Where the heavy hand of heavy taskmasters once ripped your backs to shreds, I'm going to put my peace upon you and let that be the bomb to serve your wounds as a healer. You're not going to have to remember the hardship anymore. You're coming into the fullness of my promises. What I set up, what looked like for evil, I'm setting up for your good. I'm about to flip the script and turn the tables. I will make your overseers peace and your only taskmasters righteousness. Not self-righteousness. Not, not that, but God's righteousness, the righteousness of Christ Jesus, as demonstrated by his sinless life that he lived that put him to the cross. Uh, verse 18, listen now. For those of us who witness on our street corners, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, on our television sets, violence, this is what the Lord says, violence shall no more 
be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. God is saying, regardless of what you've seen and been through, regardless of what you've lived through, the violence, the upheaval, the devastation or destruction within your borders, uh uh, no more. Those days are over. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Verse 19 The sun shall no more be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Verse 20, your, your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days, listen, 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 and your days of mourning shall be ended. Can't you feel that time sneaking up on us right now? That we're coming and approaching that day when you're mourning, you're crying, days are over, baby. You're about to come into your rejoicing. You're about to come into the joy of the Lord, which is more than your strength. It'll be your everlasting life. Verse 21, your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, this is the Lord speaking, that I may be glorified. He's saying, this is my work. This is what I'm bringing about. You are my handiwork, and in you I'm creating righteousness out of what was once unrighteousness. Yeah, I'm flipping the script. Those who called you hypocrites, those who said you couldn't live uh, the kind of life that the Lord is calling you to, God says, I'm going to complete what I began in you. And it will be not the work of your hands, but my hands upon you that will bring this about and glorify not you, but glorify me. Verse 22, here it is. For those of you, if you've ever felt left out, if you've ever felt like you've really never had, you've been forsaken even by your own family. Oh my God, that is a testimony affecting so many today because of lawlessness, the hearts of the love of many has grown cold right in our own families. This is what the Lord says. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. Oh, I believe, and if you believe like I believe you, you believe too that your time is drawing near. Our time is drawing nigh. Now, how is he going to bring all of this about, you say? I'm glad you asked. Turn with me to Haggai. Keep your finger in Isaiah, but turn with me, if you would, please, to Haggai. Turn with me to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. I want to begin at verse 3. Here we're talking about how you'll come into your inheritance. It's not going to be pretty, but God is going to do it. He's going to do it by upsetting some things on this world, by turning the world upside down, but right side up at the same time. This is how God said he would do it. He, he says how he'll do it through the prophecy through Haggai. This is what he says, verse, beginning at verse 3, chapter 2 of Haggai, verse 3. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? He's talking about the temple that in 70 A.D. would be uh, uh, was sacked, in fact, ransacked overrun uh, and turned upside down, talking about the temple that Solomon built. Now, it was overrun and overturned before then when the children of Israel were exiled by King Nebuchadnezzar and taken by force into, uh, uh, the, uh, into Babylon uh, at literally the, the end, by the end of a spear. Uh, by the point of an arrow, by violence, they were sacked and then taken into captivity for 70 years, and the temple was destroyed. And this is what the Lord says through Haggai, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? 
Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Uh, Jesus even prophesied that when the temple would be destroyed, which happened in 70 AD again, the temple that Solomon rebuilt, he said that not one stone would be left standing on the other. In fact, all that's left of that temple is what they call in, in Jerusalem the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall that once supported the entire structure. That's all that's left as a memorial to what was once so glorious. This is what God says. How do you see it now? You see destruction, right? Is it not as nothing in your eyes, verse 4, yet now be strong. He's talking about those who would be rebuilding that temple. He's saying, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Zehezadak the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As the Lord of hosts proclaimed to the people and their rulers and leaders in Israel of old to get to work rebuilding the temple, God is telling us to get to the work of building his kingdom on this earth. And, and your apprentice assignment is been already given to you. What are you doing with the work that you're called to? What are you doing for the kingdom right now? Are you being faithful in your stewardship of the work that you've been called and purposed to do? Because that will determine even whether or not you're going to make it into the kingdom, much less what you will manage on God's behalf once you're there. He's saying, be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. You might seem like you are people forsaken, but I have not forsaken you. I've not given up on you. I'm still with you. So would you not fear? Would you be strong today as the world cowers in fear? Would you get busy working on the work that I've called you to in my kingdom. Save some souls in this last hour. Don't be slack and lax in proclaiming the good news of the gospel as these last minutes and hours begin to tick down. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, here's how you're going to come into your inheritance. Are you ready? Verse 6, for thus says the Lord of hosts. He, he prefaces going into how you're going to transition into your kingdom with this one phrase. <coughs> it is so important. Remember this. Write it down if you have to. Because I think we're going to all need this in this week. We need this in this hour. Fear not. That is his declaration before he goes into the transference of your inheritance, how it will happen. <clears throat> Pardon me. The, the Lord says, fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. My God, what is God doing right now in this hour? On this Tuesday, the 19th of September, what is God doing if he is not shaking the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the dry land, we're witnessing uh, uh, record earthquakes within a short span of time, an 8.1 off the coast of Mexico, a 7.1 just less than two weeks later, right in the midst of central Mexico, which brought down buildings and towers in Mexico City this very hour. What are we seeing in, on the sea? We're seeing mass destruction as a uh, uh, Category 5 hurricane. The third one to come, the fourth one in sequence, but the third one that's bringing devastation in the Caribbean and is threatening the eastern seaboard of the United States perhaps days from now. Once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Verse 7. And I will shake all nations so that, listen, listen, listen. Remember what God declared in Isaiah chapter 60. 
that he would present all of the wealth of the nations and lay it at your feet. How will it happen? Here's how it will happen. Now you're going to start thanking God for the shaking and the quaking rather than being fearful of it. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house, whose house? The Lord's house, the house that he's building through you and I with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Wow, isn't that something? Uh, this is how he will do it. He will do it using natural disasters to bring about his providential divine purposes. We have nothing to fear with the, by the earthquake. We have nothing to fear by the storms. God is using it for your good to advance his kingdom to you and through you. Ah, as T.D. Jakes used to be fond of saying, get ready, get ready, get ready. Here's a get ready word. God is preparing you for reigning. You're training for reigning because he's going to put you in position to be his kingdom manager on this earth just as you were created to do from the very beginning. That's why he placed an entrepreneurial spirit in you. Time to shake it loose, shake it out because you're coming into your management responsibilities as was given to the first managers, Adam and Eve, right from the beginning. We're going back to the future. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. Not might, shall come in. And I will fill this house. God is being specific. This house. <coughs> With glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now, verse 8. Now he's quantifying what he's speaking of. Some folk were going to get, try to get super spiritual with this. Well, he's talking about spiritual matters. He's just talking about the spirit realm. He's not talking about material things. He's not talking about physical things. Oh, contraire. Verse 8. This is God still speaking. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord, declares the Lord of hosts. All right. He's making a declaration. You try to prove him wrong, because I heard him say that the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And he's declaring specifically the wealth of the, of the, of the earth, because all of this comes from out of the earth. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. I've been in gold mines in, in, in South Africa, and it was one of the most scary experiences in my life. Uh, I never really had issues with claustrophobia, but claustrophobia will draw up on you in a mine shaft. You're hundreds of feet below the surface, and uh, the only light you have is a lantern that's on your helmet. And, and that's about it. If those lights go out, you can see the hand in front of you. That's how dark it is. But in those gold mines, they bring out the wealth that is in God's earth. And it is a magnificent process by which they do it. But God is claiming that as his. And this is what he's saying. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Here it is, verse number 9. The latter glory of this house. What house? You the house. I'm the house. We are the house. We are his tabernacle. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, how I started building my house, I started with a couple by the name of Adam and Eve. And they wound up uh, desecrating the house that I was building through them. But I'm going to redo the project. I'm going to do a reconstruction, a renewal, and a salvage process off of the house that has been defiled. I'm doing a new thing, and I've already done it through my son Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed, where your house is painted a crimson red. Not just for the color of it, but for the salvation of it. Because anything that's covered by the blood of Jesus is safe. <laughs> safe. All right? This Passover is just a representation of what God has promised from, from that moment to the fact that as long as you're covered by the blood, you're safe. And he says, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Didn't we hear that same declaration through the prophet Isaiah? That in that place of turmoil, he will manifest his peace. He's, he's doubling down on it right here in Haggai. 
Haggai and Isaiah prophesied about the same time period. So God was being clear to give a word and give a confirming word. God is not messing around. He wants you to get this, so please get it. In all of the upheaval that you're seeing, God says, yeah, I'm going to bring upheaval on the world, but for you, I'm, I mean it for your peace. Don't get it twisted. Don't get scared. Fear not. Continue the work that I've called you to and that I've purposed you to because you're going to be the only light that's left on this earth. I need my light to be cast and seen through you. And you're going to bring that good news of that gospel before I bring an end to this age. And we're on the clock. And that clock is ticking. Amen? Now, I want to close this uh, by bringing us into the New Testament. Some people might kind of poo-poo this whole thing. Well, that's all Old Testament stuff, uh, uh, Pastor. Well, let's bring it into the New Testament. If you would, turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I just got two quick verses to read that kind of tie this directly in to us today in our New Testament dispensation of God's grace. For those of you who would uh, underrate the Old Testament, I got a word for you. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he spoke out of the Old Testament, he meant in the New Testament. He just puts his grace into operation in the New Testament because now the blood that was shed by way of lambs is now shed by the one lamb. And everything was, is fulfilled through Christ Jesus. Here's what he says concerning what he's promised his people and the fact that you are a part of his people. Verse, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people. Talking to you. Talking to, there is no Jew and Gentile here in this, in this New Testament dispensation. If you are in Christ, Christ doesn't recognize culture. He doesn't recognize ethnicity. He doesn't recognize color. Put all that stuff aside. That is nonsense. That just serves as a distraction. God is saying that there is no male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And of us all being one, you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim, listen, that you may do what? Proclaim. Proclaim means to speak. Speak. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into what? His marvelous light. What did Isaiah prophesy? That, you, that the light of the Lord would be upon you even as the world grows dark and darkness falls upon the peoples. So we're getting a New Testament spin on an Old Testament truth. God confirming his word. Yes, this is good for right now, for my church, for the church age. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10, here we are. Here's where I dwell. I don't know about you, but here's where I dwell. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Without repentance, there is no mercy. You can't come to belief in Christ Jesus. You cannot invite him into your heart to live as Lord and Savior, to reign and rule you physically, spiritually, materially, relationally, in every aspect and dispensation of your life without first repenting. Jesus said himself, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can't come to him without repenting first. You can't. So you, there is no mercy without repentance. So if you're standing in the need of forgiveness today before our holy God, so you can be looked upon him as being part of that, whole, that royal priesthood, a holy nation, how God cleans up unholy folk and makes them holy just by the presence of the covering of the blood of the Lamb shed on your behalf and mine on Calvary where we're able to live out this truth 
of entrepreneurial greatness beyond your imagination. Oh, I love what the Lord says. Let's still stick with the New Testament, shall we? And I do believe it's uh, Colossians, no, uh, 1 Corinthians, I do believe, chapter 2, uh, verse 9, no, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, that no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the imagination of man the good things that God has prepared for those who love him. We're about to come into your good thing. You're about to come into that goodness, that, that good thing you can't even imagine. But God gives us imagery in Isaiah chapter 60. He gives us imagery of how we're coming into the, 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 the wealth, the, the, the wealth of the nations, how it will be transferred to you. It ain't going to be pretty, but it's going to happen, and it's happening right now. He's going to do it by way of shaking the heavens and the earth the sea, and the dry land. And we're seeing them do that right now. Get ready to come into your season. It's what we've been waiting for, our blessed hope. We're training for reigning. Let's get straight right now. Let's get ready right now. Let's prepare right now. If you've blown it, I know I've blown it. But we can repent right now. We can say, Lord, forgive me for falling short. Forgive me of where I've blown my stewardship assignment. Forgive me where I've mismanaged the treasure that you've given me, where I've mismanaged the relationships that you've given me, where I've mismanaged those opportunities to proclaim your lordship and declare your salvation to those who are lost. God, forgive me. God says this, if you confess, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness. So go before him. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Get to the work of being forgiven, of repentance, and then God will give you the work that you've been purposed and blessed to do. He'll bless your work. And he'll put you in position to reign and rule with him, that the wealth of the nations will come in, and they'll come into him through you. Praise God. Aren't you excited tonight? Aren't you just ready to get your praise dance on? Because he's coming. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Now, I want to invite you this particular Thursday. Uh, we're having a special edition of Perspective Matters online Bible study. We're, we're going to study the Feast of Trumpets. And guess when it begins? Uh, that watch period begins on Thursday, the 21st, right up until the 23rd. And it all hinges on what happens in the heavens. No one can declare exactly what date it will fall upon. It all depends on how the stars align. And they are aligning as they never have since 2,000 years ago when they first announced the birth of a king in Bethlehem. Those same planets have converged again to form what looks like a single star, but actually it's two planets moving its closest together in their orbit than they have in 2,000 years when they first did to declare and mark Christ coming the first time. And here it is, 2,000 years later, they've lined up exactly the same way. He's coming. He's announced it. He's calling us out in the heavens and saying, hey, get ready. I'm coming. I'm shaking things up. I'm coming. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Praise God. Let's uh, pray out. <clears throat> Pardon me, and uh, thank God I still have what's left of a voice. And we're going to pray out tonight. And um, uh, we want to this week take the opportunity to watch and pray. In this week that where we celebrate the Feast of Trumpets that the today's Jewish people call Rosh Hashanah, uh, we're going to call it by what it originally is, the Feast of Trumpets. God is about to blow the horn and call us home. Amen. So we need to get ready. We need to watch and pray. Join us tomorrow morning on our Perspective Matters prayer call at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, 5 Central, 4 Mountain Time, and 3 a.m. Pacific Time. Ooh, I know it's early but it's going to be worth it. The Lord says to be ready. He says that we are to be like he used the, the parable of ten virgins. He said half of them had their oil in their lamps and they stood ready. They were ready to expect the bridegroom to come at any time. Whereas the others, uh, they didn't have enough oil for their lamps. They were sleeping on the job. Let's wake up 
to the responsibility of our being ready so we're not found nodding off when we need to be wide awake expecting our bridegroom to come. Amen? So we're going to meet tomorrow and pray, watch and pray. We're going to pray for the world that it will see the signs just as clearly as we do and come to their salvation before it's too late. All right, we are the Jonas sent into this world. Let's get it done on behalf of our loving Lord and Savior. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time together. Lord God, thank you, Father, for the entrepreneurial spirit you've placed in us. Thank you for trusting us with worldly riches that we may be made ready by training and reigning for the riches that we can't even imagine. Riches that are spiritual as well as physical and material and relational as we come into the fullness of our relationship with you and those who love you like we do, where we will fellowship eternally, worshiping at your feet, declaring you holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Father God, thank you for this time. We anticipate your coming. Get us ready, let, not, let, not allowing us to sleep through your coming. Cause us to be alert, O oh God, to these times in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord God, we ask and pray that anyone in the need of salvation, Lord, that they would come before you right now, humbling themselves and pray. Lord Jesus, I know that you came to the earth and you died for my sins. Thank you for allowing yourself to go to that cross. No one takes your life. You gave it up for me. Thank you, Lord. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of all that I've done to blow it. Now come and restore me as never before. Turn me into that new creature, creation, that new creature that you've promised, that I might enjoy eternal life with you and live and reign with you right here on this earth during your millennial reign. And then when you turn into turn this place into a new heaven, a new earth and a new heaven, that I'd be right there on the scene with you. I thank you and I praise you for saving me, being coming, my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe that you're born again. You're now a part of the kingdom of God. Welcome to the family, the family of faith. Stick with us. God has taken us places. God bless you. Make sure you you peep us out online at perspectivematters.org. That's our website, as well as our Facebook page. We're active on social media and real active nowadays because there's a lot going on to report. Amen. God bless you. I love you in the Lord. Go in peace. Don't go to pieces. God bless you. <laughs>